11. Acts chapter 11. I will have a box. I'll have a box at the house that will put the Bibles in in the back on the deacon's bench back there. And then end of the month, I will send them to Springfield. So if you happen to have any extra Bibles that you have at the house, uh, we'll ship them what they'll do as what uh, Brother Gray said is that they have missionaries and they're training young men to be pastors and they give them those Bibles, Bibles and then and Bible study methods, stuff like that that they could be able to have to be able to preach and to teach. So um, I think that's just, that's a great way to help extend our ministry opportunities here at the church. And so I noticed there's a couple of them on that back table. We'll just collect what we have and then we'll ship what we have. And then we'll just pray that God will get them to the right people. And I'll ask him to let me know what country they go to and we'll kind of go from there. Yes. They they need to be gently used, not not wore out like we have. Oh, yeah. Mine too. Well, I do too. But um, preachers like to look at study notes from other people. Um, it's amazing that different people I have. Um, Brother Forehand's chronological Bible that he study out of. Ms. Forehand gave to me, so I have notes from him uh, that I've looked at before. And then I've also, my father-in-law, I've had one of his Bibles. And then uh, my pastor um, that I got saved under, I have one of his Bibles. And so it, it's just, it's as a preacher, you look at it, you know, you get a different perspective from other people and things like that. And um, it's just it's just good to have. It doesn't hurt. It's no different than me having a study Bible in my that I preach out of that has notes and things like that. And so it doesn't hurt to have writing of things. Okay. Who said it has five Bibles? One that she was cremated with, and then I have five other ones. I'm not going to keep five Bibles. I can only read one at a time. There's one that's here, but everything else is everything going to go. She would not want it to just be sitting collecting dust. She wanted to go into ministry. That's why the clothing and stuff, it will be going to uh, either the clothing place off of Li at Living Faith or Pitnaz that has a clothing place for foster kids. Uh, I, believe, I believe that would be the best to go to to be able to continue the ministry. She was not into helping support companies to make money off of her. And if I ever did, was if I was to ever send it anywhere, take it there, I would do Salvation Army because a lot of the money they get stays in the city of Pittsburgh. And that would be just another way of ministry here. I also know the captain over there too. So uh, that's what we would do. So that's what I'm planning on doing. So um, Acts chapter 11, look at verses 17 and following says this. For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Venus and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. But some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas that, should, that, they, that he should go as far as Antioch. Notice it says, then tidings of, the, of these things came unto the ears of the church. But who's the ears of the church? People. They were hearing testimonies. Uh, they were hearing uh, the good things that's happening in Antioch. They were hearing about how the uh, Gentiles were coming to know Christ. They were believing in Christ. So the Jewish 
main Jewish ministry there in Jerusalem, they were listening and they were hearing about great things that happened. That's why they sent Barnabas there uh, to find out what's going on. Uh, who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. But look at the aspect that they were preaching the word of God. The word of God was being blessed. And it was as it was being preached, it was being taught, it was being shared, many people were coming to know the Lord. And it's very important to understand the, the power that you have right here. You have Jesus Christ in word form right here. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. So the significance of this book right here has power. It has power to save, it has the power to deliver, it has the power to guide, it has the power to encourage, it has the power to uplift. This book is a powerful book. That's why Satan doesn't like us to study it. That's why he doesn't like us to preach about it. That's why he doesn't like us to, to share it because he knows. Satan knows more than what we let him let on to, to what he thinks he can do. Remember, he's been with God for a long time. He's seen how God works. That's why he fights. That's why he waters the word of God down to be able to make sure that uh, people don't, don't change. And so we're going to look at this aspect of how to listen to God's word. Now go to Matthew chapter 13, Matthew chapter 13. We heard this basically last week from Brother Gray, and it's a little bit of a different uh, spin from what he was talking about. Um, the last two, three weeks that bef before Lucinda went to be the Lord, um, she said, I want to hear the word of God. And so I would read it to her. And then there's sometimes as I read, fall asleep, because I'd be tired. I want to hear the word of God. I want to hear the word of God. So I basically got online and I found um oh what was that the guy that did the word reading of the word of god um long time did a long time ago uh but um i would basically find books of the bible and have it read and just be in the background and you just see her she would enjoy it she'd smile she would listen and um after a little while after this in the past i started doing the same thing it was just it was it, I mean, literally going to sleep and listening to the Bible being read to us is important. Why? Because when the word of God gets to our lives and encourages us and strengthens us. So what kind of a hearer are we? Mark, Matthew chapter 13, verses 1 and following says this. The same day went Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside. And great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so they went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Now what's a parable? An earthly story with what? A heavenly meaning. That's right. And so Jesus didn't forthright preach it because, one, they couldn't accept it. They didn't understand the concepts. So he had to give something for them to understand. That's why in my preaching I give a lot of different life examples because people can understand a little bit better. And so, um, and it says, behold, the sower went forth to sow. Now we know what a sower is, right? A person that sows seed. And when he sowed, some seeds fell by the wayside, and the fowls came and devoured them up. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth. And forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. And when the sun was up, they were scorched. And because they had no root, they withered away. And some fell upon thorns. The thorns sprung up and choked them. But other fell into good ground and brought forth fruit, some a hundredfold, some sixtyfold, and some thirtyfold. Who hath ears to hear, let him hear. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. He was telling the disciples, hey, I'm going to give you the straight truth because I'm going to pass this on to you for you to share it. 
but you're, you're being taught to learn how to receive it. You're being taught how to understand it. You're, you're listening to me and I'm teaching you. But the people that are following me, they're not following me 24-7. And so I'm going to have to give it to them to where they can understand it. And in verse 12, For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Therefore spake I to them to parables, because they seeing not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and ye and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and she be, should be converted, and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see, and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. He's saying, you know, there's a lot of folks who like to be able to enjoy the benefits that you have. Wouldn't it have been great as a, as a child of God to be able to sit down and actually listen to Jesus teach? For him that has the, the, all the knowledge of, of, of uh, eternity, to listen to Jesus, the great master teacher, teaching what God was trying to say. He's saying, you've got a privilege here. You better be listening because other folks don't have that privilege. Hear ye therefore the parable of the sower. When anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth the way that which is sown in his heart. This is he which receives seed by the wayside. So he's saying that if you're a non-believer and anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth not, that's why it's important to make it to where people can understand it. You can't use huge doctrinal words to try to impress people. As I said this morning, keep the cookies on the bottom shelf. Make it to where even the youngest person can hear and understand. It blesses my heart to have Christian bring Esther every Sunday. And it blesses my heart even though to have that, that girl's got a grip. Now I'm telling you, that grip's getting stronger when she grabs that beard of mine. I mean, I mean, she she's getting a good grip on that thing. I don't know if there's some strength in my beard, but boy, she has a strong grip. But the fact is this, is that, and Chris and I have talked about this. She said, I want my daughter to be under the word of God to hear it because I want my daughter to be saved at an earliest age as possible. I want her to avoid a lot of the mistakes uh, of children and teenagers and adults. I want my daughter to understand that. That's why she said, I hope you don't. I said, I don't care. Let that baby start squalling. If I cannot preach that baby, I'm going to quit preaching. <laughs> I've said that for years. And it's, it's true. Is that the fact is this. This book has power. And if people don't understand it, if we don't make it to where they can understand what the word of God is saying, it's kind of like Charlie Brown's teaching once again. Wow, wow, wow. What am I doing here? I'm kind of going through the motions. You know, I, I was talking to some uh, someone that, that I work with, and uh, they were telling me about their denomination, is that there's a lot of Methodist churches closing in Kansas. And she was telling me about different churches having, having uh, auctions, stuff like that for their materials. I'm thinking, why? She said, well, people just don't have any desire to come to church anymore. And if you were to go back to the 30s and 40s with the, um, with the, the revivals, I mean, literally... When they would have those, those revivals in communities, it would be the Methodists and the Presbyterians and the Lutherans and uh, the Baptists and the, 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 what they call the Holy Rollers, the Assembly of Gods. They would all get together and they would pray. And then they would work together for citywide revivals. And literally those towns, would they would experience revival because they made sure that the preaching was as simple as the youngest child on, in the audience so that they can understand it. But then all of a sudden we get all this education and they, uh, one priest used to say, our seminaries are become, making our churches cemeteries. Because, yeah, you get all this knowledge and all this fancy theology 
and, and a lot of times they try to espouse it, and people say, huh? What'd you just say? I mean, there's a lot of big words that I learned in college. Uh, had to have it interpreted several times, bring it down to my level, and I just determined, and just to make it as simple to where when I was done, that someone would say, you know what? I didn't like what he had to say, but I understood what he had to say. I'd much rather have someone say, I don't agree with you, than someone to say, you wasted your time preaching that half hour, 45 minute message because I got absolutely nothing out of it because you didn't make it to where it was applicable to me. It is important to understand this belief. That's why when we're sharing, sharing our testimonies and we're sharing the word of God, it's not demeaning to people when you just basically say things that they understand. That's why I use a lot of illustrations, a lot of illustrations. It's just because people understand illustrations. You talk about, you talk about it's the seasons. You know, you got the winter, you got the spring, you got the summer, you got the fall. And the significance of the, the winter, we don't see anything happening. We see what we think is death. It's not death. It's rejuvenation. It's reinvigorating. It's preparing. Because at the right time, at the right moment, that when the heat starts coming and the water starts coming and, and things start to melt, all of a sudden, those, um, those things inside that tree begin to start to spread. The sap begins to spread. And all of a sudden, guess what happens on those trees that, were, that looked like they were dead? All of a sudden, they have, they, have, uh, they have life. They have these leaves out there. Then you look at from the springtime, thank God for the springtime, because you have all those leaves out there, because the summertime, you need it to be able to stay on it to cool down a little bit. And then you look at the aspect of what's fall. The, fa the fact is that what you enjoyed in the summertime, now it's time for that tree to release what they've given and then start another cycle over again. That's life. Life is cyclical. You have High days, you have low days. You have things where it go wonderful, and sometimes it's horrible. But that's the cycle of life. And people can, can understand when you look at the, the seasons and, and, and have to understand is that when you look at your life, you've had good days, you've had bad days, you've had great days, you've had horrible days, but it, it changes on a constant basis. And so when people understand that, that the fact is that God gives us nature. You know, when I talk about God being consistent, they'll say, well, how do you know God's consistent? Did the sun come up this morning? And where's it going to go tonight? It's going gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna to set. But does it stay down there all the time? No, because while it's setting down here, it is rising in the other part of the world. So God just keeps going. And then... Um, you say, well, I've, uh, I've been underneath the cloud and, and it's been raining. Well, you get in an airplane, you get above that cloud, it's, the sunshine is bright and it's hot. Just because you don't see it, don't mean it's not there. And so you explain God that way. People can understand things like that. And he is saying that when, when the, they don't get it, the evil one, the evil one, what does he do? It says, the, and understand that, then cometh the wicked one and catcheth the way that which is sown in his heart. This is he which received the seed by the wayside. So the wicked one will always make sure there's lots of distractions. The wicked one will always make sure that once we leave church, that something's going to come up to get us distracted from what we heard. But he that received the seed into stony places, the same as he that heareth the word and anon with joy received it. There's some folks that, that hear it. Say, Man, that was great. I needed to hear that. Although it's temporary and the ground is what? It's stony. But then also, yet hath he not root in himself, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word, by and by he is offended. Throughout our course, our journey of Christianity, how many people can you remember that used to go 
to church, were excited about the word of God that was even involved in ministry, and something came up, and then now you can't even talk to them about God anymore. They're angry. They're bitter. They don't want to talk to you about God. Why? Because they're, they're stony. You know, I, I could take seeds and I can plant them out there in these rocks. Some of them, some of that will grow. But then you get a little bit of heat and no water. Guess what happens to the, the, the plants that grow up? They'll die because they have nothing to be able to gain strength from. Yet he hath not root in himself, but dureth for a while. But when tribulation or persecution arises because of the word, by and by he is offended. He also that receives seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. Here is the care of this world and deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. I had friends I went to Bible college with and um, man, you talk about some preachers. I mean, some dynamic preachers, love the Lord, uh, just, just powerful, powerful servants of the Lord. But they got involved with situations where uh, they were making a lot of money. And they chose to turn away from the ministry for the sake of making that extra dollar. And the very fact is that afterwards, I've talked to them. I've, I've caught up with them. So how are you doing? I don't want to talk to you. Why? You're going to judge me. I just said, how are you doing? I'm not judging anything. And... They're, they're on edge because they're afraid because they know they made a bad mistake. I just told them that everyone makes bad mistakes. It's a matter of understanding that, recognizing it, and turning that thing around. And they're so afraid because of the judgment of other people. They've chosen to just wander in their Christian lives than to be able to deal with the fact of people may say something. I told them, you can't go anywhere with anybody judging you. You go to the store, they judge you. I mean, you, you go to work, they judge you. You go to your family, they judge you. Everywhere you go, there's judgment. But I guarantee it, you can go to the bank, they judge you, but you're still going to go back to the bank. You're going to go to Walmart, and you're not going to like the judgment. I promise you that when you need groceries, you're heading to Walmart or Dillon's or Deron's or even Aldi's. That's not going to stop you. Well, I was judged, but I'm still going to go back. Why is it that when Christians don't get back to God? Because we're dealing with not the physical, but the spiritual. Because Satan fears when God's people get right with God, he fears their testimony. Remember what the maniac of Gadara, Jesus told the maniac of Gadara, because he wanted to be with Jesus. He said, go home to thy friends and show them what great things they had done for thee and had compassion on thee. Jesus knew the significance of the, ma the, the maniac was this. Yeah, you can come with me and uh, you can listen to me, but your testimony is more powerful because they've seen the bad in you. Now you can see what made the change? The aspect of having compassion. That's what changed the maniac of Gadara. And then you can say, this is what Jesus did for me. He changed me. He loved me. He brought me back into the fold. He encouraged me. He assured me that I'm still his child and I still have value in his life. And all of a sudden, guess what? You, when you're in that position and you're sharing your testimony of being away from God and coming back to God, there's a whole lot of people out there say, you know what? I need to hear that because I've been listening to think of I can't go back there because of this, that, and the other. That's why Satan fights Christians that get away from God. Because he doesn't want them to testify and encourage and strengthen other believers. Because we have such an amount of people that are right on the edge. And so we need to pray for them. But also, verse 23. I'll end with this. This is kind of like the introduction for, for this, this message. But he that receives seed into the good ground, and see that heareth the word, and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit, and bringeth, bringeth fruit, some a hundredfold, 
some 60, and some 30. Good ground has got to be prepared. When we used to have a garden, I used to have a guy come and disc that thing. I mean, <coughs> and he, he would tell me, he said, you've got good ground. He said, I said, why is that? Because it's dark, but there's an awful lot of worms in there. He said, those worms, will be your, they're your best ally with, with your garden. And uh, he said, now I'll disc it up, but then you go and you get your little, your little tiller and you do your little rows, stuff like that. You have a good garden. It was worked. And so it's got to be worked, but then hear the word. Faith comes by what? Hearing. Listening and hearing by the word of God, understanding. That's where Romans 10, 17 falls right in line with this, is that people, you can tell people the word of God, and they're not going to understand it unless you bring it down to where they can understand it. I think, as I end with this, I think the greatest opportunity I had when I was in Bible college in Oklahoma City, was we had, an, um, we had a Sunday school and junior church of folks that came from the, edu on the, um, the group homes uh, in Oklahoma City. And we're talking about ones that were struggling with their, their educational level. And uh, literally, when, you, when you're up there trying to teach the Word of God, and they're, you're talking about 50, 60-year-old people, and they have an a IQ level of like a 7- or 8-year-old. It's difficult. But when we, me and another man, he's a pastoring up in Canada right now, and we determined that we're going to make that, that, that church as viable for them as it was the main auditorium with 3,000 people sitting in there, they would understand it in that classroom as much as they as those who are listening to the pastor. And you want to talk about dealing with, and we spent some time learning, the, dealing with theology to where they could understand it. And when they were going back to their group homes, they were sharing with their group homes and the leaders, all the people around that, what they learned. And the pastor got a phone call from one of them, said, we don't know what you guys are doing. And the pastor said, what do you mean? And explain what's going on. And they said, keep it up. We like it. With, that's the purpose of church. We send them not to be babysat. We send them that they can learn about God. And when he walked in our in between Sunday school and church, and he walked into our room, we're thinking, uh oh, we're dead. Why is the pastor not in the main auditorium? Why is he back here with us? And he talked to them and told them that he loved them. And he told, told myself, and my other, other preacher friend, we're still studying to be preachers, said, gentlemen, you keep up the good work. God is going to honor your work because I've already heard good testimonies from these good folks going back to where they're from about what you're doing. Keep up the good work. You know, and, you know, God wants all to be saved. There's no age level where people can't be saved. But they've got to understand it. And so when you make it to where it's simple and to where they can grasp a hold of it, and all of a sudden, guess what you're doing? You're planting seeds. You say, well, the ground's not, not prepared. That's not our job to prepare the ground. That's God's job. But a seed does no good sitting in the bag. A seed does no good sitting on the shelf. A seed does no good at, at the grain store. A seed is only good when it's taken out of that bag and it's put into the ground. That's what the purpose of the seed was made for. Got to get it in there and let God take care of the rest. And we see what God can do. And, and that's the thing about that. And there's three different levels. You have some 100-fold, some 60, and some 30. You may not know um, what the production level is, but it doesn't matter. You look at an ear of corn, you're going to have a whole lot of, a lot of uh, little kernels on your corn. But then you get a, uh, you put, plant a potato in there, you may have just a few potatoes, uh, but it doesn't matter. It's what you plant, what you're going to get back. That's what that matters. Because we're doing it as unto the Lord. And so looking at the source of truth, the word of God, and looking at the, the, the mission that God has given to us, it is all about us 
being prepared to do as God wants us to do, to minister as unto the Lord, to the multitude of people that's going to cross our path. We serve a big God who wants a lot of people to know about him, and God has tasked us and other believers uh, of the same faith to do likewise. Father, now bless us as we get ready to leave this place. Honor your word. Honor your servants. Honor what we do for you. Be glorified in all that's said and done, Jesus. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Well, Brother Bob, we'll come up here. We'll take up an offering. And then after we take up the offering, we will dismiss. And don't forget, next Sunday,